welcome to this edition of the Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition podcast, brought to you by the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I'm Brian O'Connor, Adjunct Professor of Entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago. And joining me today, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Chuck Michelum, founder of Alert Protective, and David Silverstein, who is the now CEO of Alert Protective. Thank you, David and Chuck, for joining. Great. Uh, I think what a nice way to start would be, um, Chuck, to hear a little bit of the story behind Alert Protective and how you came to found your business and uh, a little bit of the evolution. Oh, sure. Um, so when I went to college a long time ago, uh, I used to work for a local locksmith and I kind of learned uh, security through that. And uh, after I got through with school, I worked in uh, point of purchase advertising for a few years and uh, just wasn't quite happy with that and so then I kind of gravitated back towards security and then wanted to do something that had a recurring revenue theme to it and in speaking with you know friends family and so forth it just seemed like security was a a good fit for me and with uh, electronic security was on the rise doing my research and so that's how I gravitated towards that uh, started on my own uh, met a fellow by the name of Ken Steenland who was also uh, in the alarm business at the time. And then he and I uh, merged together and uh, we were business partners for many, many years. Uh, and Ken passed away now about, oh, about nine years ago, I'd say. And uh, we operated Alert Protective together for, for so many, many years. Great, yeah. great, thanks. Uh, David, how, yeah, I'm, um, you, you, maybe a little bit of background on uh, the search fund that you operated and how you came to learn of Alert Protective and meet Chuck and ultimately partner. Sure. Uh, so I, my background is really a traditional investment banking, private equity background. And uh, I found that over the years, I always had what I call an entrepreneur burn, um, but struggled with how to engage that. Growing up, my dad started uh, and ran an air conditioning company for many years. And I was always inspired by that risk that he took uh, and the autonomy he had as, a, as an owner operator. And uh, I made the decision to go to business school. I went to, to Wharton and right around the time that I made that decision, found out about the search fund model, and much like many other people dug into the uh, materials that are out there that describe the model. And it really, uh, the light bulb went off for me. It struck me as a, a great hybrid between what I had done and being able to leverage those deal skills and uh, where I wanted to be, which was to be an owner operator of a business. So I launched the search fund in uh, June of 2015 after graduating from Wharton and embarked on this journey of traveling the country to try to find a company. One of the things I, I learned over time was how important to me uh, cultural fit was, as you think about a deal. And uh, Alert Protective is a company that came through a broker uh, who had an expertise in the alarm industry. I tried to stay on his radar and had evaluated a handful of opportunities, but when I, the more I learned about Alert and the more I learned about Chuck, the more excited I was about the opportunity. And uh, basically, uh, when I found out about it, the next day I was on a, on a flight uh, and, and lucky enough to meet with Chuck, and um, I think that uh, it turned out pretty well. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Chuck, um, you uh, were, were clearly talking to uh, David and a handful of other potential partners for your business. Um, could you maybe describe that process and how you thought about selecting the right partner to take your business into its next chapter of, of growth? Um, and, and maybe what specifically about David uh, you saw and made you compelled to, to choose him as a partner? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, one of the things I always realized was if I sold the company to a, a major, another major player in this industry, that the Alert Protective brand and the name and everything we've worked so hard to build would go away. And that wasn't one of the things I wanted to see happen. Um, and so as David came along, uh, this just seemed culturally and uh, otherwise just as a really good fit that he had the ability with his background in education and, and his work experience to take the brand and drive it forward uh, for years to come, yeah. which is a pleasure for me to see. Yeah, that's great. Now, how how involved do you remain in the business? Is you know on a on a day to day, week to week, month to month basis? Uh, 
Well, now I'd say we're going, what, into almost six months or so, somewhere in that time frame. So uh, I'm still doing sales for the company. I still have a lot of contacts in the industry. So I'm mostly supporting the organization, I think, through, you know, advising David to some extent, but then also still doing primarily sales for the organization. Yeah. Can you help us understand um, the decision to sell? Um, you know, you, you engaged a, a, a banker, a, a broker to help you through the process. You know, what was it that led you to uh, that point and, and you sort of determining that that was the right next stage of your company's life cycle? Sure. Um, well, I'm coming up on year 34 in doing this, so it's a long time. Uh, and so I just turned 60 this, uh, in fact, this past Sunday I just turned 60. Uh, so I really have given this a lot of thought and I had given a lot of thought. You know, my life somewhere between 60 and 70 and what I could do with my time and my ability to go do things and enjoy my life uh, is so different from what it would be from, let's say, 70 to 80. So um, being an entrepreneur, nights, weekends, it's really a six day a week, sometimes seven day a week gig. So I thought it was time to turn the reins over to somebody younger and see it drive forward. Yeah, and you've, you've found that in David, that's yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. What, um, you know, y you guys met, uh, sparks flew, emotions ran high, I'm sure it was, it was uh, great sort of envisioning your business being transitioned to someone as capable uh, and as qualified as, as David. Were there, you know, the diligence process can wear on both the buyer and the seller, were there parts of the negotiation or part of the diligence process that maybe um, challenged the early stages of both of your relationship? Can you maybe speak openly to the extent you're uh, uh, willing to about some of those challenges that you encountered during the negotiation? I wouldn't say there was any sort of outlier you know, issues or, or things that aren't normal to a deal-making process. One of the things that's unique about the search model and small business deal-making in general is that it's very different, uh, particularly from my background, where something is, even though there was a, an intermediary involved here, you know, perfectly packaged business with all the you know, financials and everything ready to go for, for a new buyer to come in, I think that um, you know, there was a lot of uh, collaboration that had to happen to get us to the closing table. And ultimately, the bottom line is, this deal would not have happened if we didn't have a dynamic of trust and we talk about this all the time, I mean, things come up, you know, there are complicated topics in a deal. What is working capital or how do we treat, you know, valuing the inventory, things that, you know, in every deal can become very contentious. And if you don't have an established level of trust, you just can't work through them. And so the dynamic that I found with Chuck, which ultimately led me to get comfortable to move here and, you know, basically put my whole professional career behind this business, is that there was no, there were no secrets? You know, we we basically reasonable minds came together. We sat down. We talked about anything that may have came up, come up, and um, and we worked through it. Yeah. So a, a baseline and a foundation of trust in the relationship sounds uh, critical, and I would agree with that. Um, you've now uh, become day to day partners, Chuck. You've mentioned that you're still involved in the business, David. How does that you know look for you? as sort of the new leader of the company, um, how do you guys work together? How does that relationship play out on a day-to-day -day basis? And how does that um, sort of impact your uh, relationships with some of your key deputies at, at Alert Protective? It's a, it, you know, it's a learning process for sure. Um, I think one of the, the uh, reasons why in the search fund community there's a focus on recurring revenue is, is the idea that it allows a searcher like myself to kind of have some time and sort of figure out the lay of the land uh, before we start to make strategic changes or, or, or you know, move the business along. Um, ultimately, you know, it, it can be great at times, it can be difficult at times. I mean, you know, I can't speak for Chuck, but I would imagine it's one of the most difficult things, ironically, in his life, right? And this sort of very incredible, momentous thing that he was able to build this business and sell it on one hand, on the other hand, <coughs> The overnight, your day to day changes, right? And so I think my job is to try to always remember that. You, know, you get caught up in the daily grind and try to respect that reality. Um, but I think, I think I've found that Chuck also has, he's studied the search fund materials, he's on the board of directors, so he has the benefit of having this bigger picture vision and understanding that at the end of the day, you have to have faith and, and uh, that we're all on the same team. And so the changes we make, as uncomfortable as they may be, or the challenges we have, 
it's all in the best interest of, of growing the brand. Yeah. You mentioned cultural fit. You, you mentioned a couple times now recurring revenue. Um, what were some of the things that you saw in Alert Protective, aside from those that, that you know, really drew you to say, this is the company that I want to stake the entirety of my rest of my career on? Um, and what, what were the, you know, let's talk a little bit about those. And then also the things that, you know, had they not been in ex existent in Alert Protective, it would have been sort of a non-starter. You know, what, what were those criteria and those things that you were looking for that, that you were unwavering on that, that you found in Alert Protective? So I think those uh, tie to uh, really why I was attracted to the business, which is the recurring revenue, right? It's, a, it's an important concept. It's very attractive um, for a number of reasons. Um, and so that was one of those non-starters that, you know, if it didn't exist, this deal would not have happened. Uh, the second, which is a little corny, but is important to me, especially having kind of come through a career with investment banking and private equity, is enjoying what you do. And there's no question that when you spend the hours you do as an operator, if you don't enjoy the product you're selling, it makes no sense. And for me, I've, most of my background was in aerospace defense and security. and. Uh, with the product and the service we provide, it's not difficult to wake up every day and feel good about what you're doing for our customers. And I love that. Um, and I think that uh, that also feeds into what, uh, what the opportunity is here uh, with the business. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that, that opportunity. Chuck, you and your, um, your partner uh, in the business founded and have built a, a fantastic recurring revenue business with obviously a, a positive culture that David was, was drawn to. Um, when you were talking about sort of the, the go forward post acquisition plan, I'm assuming that that was a collaboration between the two of you in, in identifying the opportunities ahead of this business uh, that you're looking to capture. Um, what were some of those things that maybe uh, didn't exist uh, prior to the partnership with, with David? And how have you guys thought about the key levers and areas that you want to focus on to drive this business sort of to, to, into, the, into its next uh, chapter of growth and profitability? You want to share a couple of thoughts you want to make? Yeah, go ahead and then I can maybe chime in too, so sure. I think the two big buckets for me uh, were one, um, the, the industry is evolving, so I you know, don't proclaim to be an expert by any means, um, but there's no question that as technology changes, we really have to be very thoughtful about the strategic moves we make. And uh, one of the dynamics at play that's very powerful is that smart home, interactive services, whatever you want to call it, uh, there's a great amount of demand for that. And so most of the customers that we, we end up acquiring are now signing up for uh, what we call interactive services, so the ability to control your security system through your mobile phone. And it's really, it's no longer good enough to just walk into somebody's home and, and only sell them a security system, even though we do that very regularly. People want to know, can I control my thermostat or lights from my mobile phone? And the reality is we can do that. And uh, the fact that Alert had the technical capability to do that, I think made me excited about it. And now it's just a question of how do we really turn the business from a you know, four cylinder engine to an eight cylinder engine and, and, and expand the growth on that frontier. And then the second uh, part is, you know, what I think a lot of people would call man, you know, management, you know, uh, processes or improvement, operations improvement, which is a generic business school buzzword and a, and a private equity investment memo buzzword. But the fact of the matter is that's the opportunity in the search fund model. You have a small business that's, that was very well run for, for many years, but there's no doubt we can benefit from you know, best practices and management and uh, training people and uh, you know, implementing you know, performance-based compensation plans and all the things that, that make well-run businesses um, you know, go. Uh, absolutely. Chuck, anything to, to add as it relates to the, you know, the next uh, two, five, ten years of this business that you see sort of the opportunity to now pursue as a result of your partnership with David? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things we talked about even earlier was just, uh, you know, culturally to change from a family-run type of business, which, you know, say 30, 35 employees to more of a 
a corporate feel in with these drivers in place to take the business and, and, and move it forward and employee accountability and uh, different levels of management things that you know we never really had in place so accountability being a big one for employees moving forward versus just running it like a family business it's, sure it's a big deal sure um, because it was run as a family business I'm, I'm assuming that you know um, you know there, there's a there's sort of a a cliche that's overused probably, but sort of giving up some degree of control of the baby, you know, your, your baby that you've built. Can you maybe talk about over the last six months of sort of post-partnership, post um, how that passing over uh, of the baby to David has been for you um, emotionally and personally? Maybe to the extent you're comfortable sharing that, I think we'd all love to hear um, about, you know, how that transition for you has gone. It's been, you know, I won't say that it's not been difficult. It has been difficult. Uh, there's no question about that because, you know, you're used to, or I'm used to just being the guy and making all these decisions all these years. People would come to me with questions and concerns and, you know, which way, what direction we're going to go in. And so now this is changing for me. So uh, the first four months into it, call it, I'd say I think I'm getting better now. Uh, I've begun to let go, which is a big thing for me to do. It's it, it's difficult. I think it's difficult for anybody that's in the same model. There's no question about that. So it's kind of a unique thing that I'm still there. I'm I'm there working with David, um, and still able to have my role. But you know, when people come to me, I'm able to say, "Gee, you know, this is a better question for David at this point." And sure. It's uh, it's hard to do. It's not easy to do. I'm getting better at it. Though, you know. <laughs> really well, am. you you mentioned that it starts with a foundation of trust, and so I don't think you would be able to do that if you hadn't developed that level of trust with David. And it's so true. Yeah. You know, I I got to tell you a quick story too. Is uh, so I've done this for so many years. Um, I never give keys to our building to anybody, and so as far as that goes, there's just a few, handful of few people in our organization. Well, you're, you're have, in the security business, so I would, I, yeah. So <laughs> have access and codes to our building and so forth, and I think David would testify to this too. Early on, I gave him a key and a code to come into our building, which is hard for me, and so it wasn't easy, and I, and I did that pretty early on, so he was able yeah. to have full access. This is before we closed the deal, yeah, right? So exactly. we're doing due diligence. Um, and that's the type of collaboration we had. Yeah, yeah. David, um, you're a new CEO of an existing company that has decades of culture and process incumbent. Um, what have been some challenges, unique challenges that maybe you underestimated in taking that role in an organization that presumably, uh, and Chuck, correct me if I'm wrong, hasn't had an outside CEO sort of at the, at the helm? What, anything you underestimated any unique uh, challenges that you'd like to fill us in on? I, I would say the biggest challenge is is really personnel as you as you think about making changes that are perceived to be, you know, culturally contentious, right? So, you you know, all of a sudden we're we hired a you know financial controller, right? And we're and we're we're documenting payroll in different ways, or or, or you know because we have you know discipline over our financial statements. We may introduce new policies or procedures, and um, it's definitely change is difficult. And so, I think it's one of those things where, for me, you know, as the months go by, it's more of having a perspective. Look, things take time, and more and more, the importance of building what we, what we more and more call buy-in, you know, buy right? So, you've got to have people understand why you're doing things clearly, and have people feel part of the process. And so, what I'm trying to do is create a culture of empowering people to make decisions and be part of these changes that we make. We have a team on an airplane actually now going to learn from another large alarm company in the industry. I'm not going. I said, you guys go, come back with best practices and teach the rest of the team. You know, so it feels less like it's coming from the top and, and, uh, and more that we're all on the same team. And uh, so I'm, uh, you know, it takes time to kind of uh, perfect the model and we'll never be perfect. Nobody's perfect, but uh, I think we're definitely making progress. Yeah, it's, it sounds like it. Um, there are no typical days in, in what you're doing, but to the best uh, you know that you can, can you help us understand you know what the uh, what the eight to six or or however many you know, it, it you never sort of turn it off. But what is what does a typical day look like now for you, David? 
I would say that uh, really it falls into three buckets. So a third of my day is probably dealing with personnel, I don't want to call it issues, but things related to our personnel. And it could be something as simple as somebody has a, we were talking about it outside in the hall, somebody has a healthcare question, right? We don't have an HR manager, so uh, you're looking at them, right? So things like that that actually take time and you want to be thoughtful and get people the information they need. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, and then uh, the second bucket would be strategic projects. And these are the things that really you have to sit at your desk with a clear head and, and I'm you know, locked into an Excel file trying to think about what are, the, what are the, you know, the big changes we want to make to the company that will help us take it to the next level. And the best example of that is, is something that's taking up a lot of time right now. We're converting to a new ERP system. So we've invested in a new accounting and operations software. We're also launching a sales CRM and proposal writing software and on top of that, we're introducing a digital contracting module. So these are things that take an immense amount of time and energy. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then the third is really just kind of day-to-day -day blocking and tackling, clearing out your email inbox, administrative tasks. We have financial statements that we have to report to, to our lender every month. And uh, um, so it's, uh, it's an adventure. Yeah, yeah, you wear a lot of hats, it sounds like. Uh, Chuck, you mentioned that you're a member um, of a newly formed board as, as a result of, of this partnership. Um, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's a, a highly accomplished and well-appointed group, um, but nonetheless, it's um, multiple cooks in the kitchen when uh, presumably your business historically has um, you know, the mission and the strategic initiatives of the business have been largely directed by uh, you and your, your partner that, that founded the business. Um, how has that dynamic, maybe explain a little bit around how the board is constructed and how your involvement and interaction with that group of people has played out over the last six months. Sure, um, well the board is, uh, it's five of us now I think, right? We just added a, a fifth person who has a, <clears throat> a very strong accounting background as a matter of fact. And everybody that's involved does have some experience in the alarm industry itself, which is, is great, so. Um, you know, what I've seen now, and I keep saying this, is, you know, to be able to look at it at a 30,000 foot view and look into the company instead of just being inside of it and functioning on a day-to-day -day basis and actually stand outside for a little bit and with these other people, with David and other people on the board and say, yeah, this is the direction and this is a great thing and, and these guys have experience as well in business and in the alarm industry and say these are strategic moves that we should do it's fantastic. It's actually, it's, it's wonderful to see. It's, so it's everything I would want going forward for the company, especially. That's great. It sounds like it's been, uh, in the early days, it's been a good dynamic and a, and a value add uh, proposition to establish a board and the, the dynamic sounds productive. Absolutely. The, um, I want to be mind, sounds like you're both very busy with Alert Protective, so I want to be mindful of your time. But um, as a final sort of thought um, for our episode here today, Chuck, any advice or guidance that you'd give uh, a searcher, maybe that's 12 months behind where David is right now, that's out searching uh, for a company to partner with, any advice or guidance that you might give them on how to best position themselves as uh, someone that will be a good shepherd of someone's life work into its next chapter uh, of you know growth and, and evolution of the business? A anything you might sort of give as words of wisdom as to how to best uh, do that for searchers that are out there? Well, you know, I think business is kind of a funny thing and you just never know what's going to be a good fit for people. Um, I don't think there's any 100% uh, stellar way to say that, you know, culturally this person that's coming in as a searcher uh, is going to be the, is the right fit for the company. But I think just presenting themselves like David did with their background, um, that was so important to me, whether it's education, his work experience, and so forth. Those are all very, very important things, no doubt. David, any additional uh, thoughts or guidance that you might give, you know, David uh, 12 months ago for all the searchers that are out there trying to find uh, a company like Alert Protective and, and Chuck uh, that you wish you would have known uh, 12 months ago after going through the process? Well, I would just say that uh, very early on in my search process, I had an investor uh, uh, talk to me and he said, look, you have to remember that the small business deal-making space is like the Wild West. 
Um, forget about what you learned at Goldman Sachs, right? Um, you want to uh, convince an owner that you're the right person to take their business over. Um, you really have to kind of think out of the box and be willing to do untraditional things to get a deal done. And uh, it took me a little while to sort of hit my groove when I was searching, but ultimately I think when I, when I found Alert Protective, those words were very helpful for me. And there were times when I spent weeks at a time here in Chicago trying to work with Chuck to get a deal done where I could have easily, you know, sort of flown back and said, well, let the third party diligence companies do their thing. <laughs> But I said, no, I'm going to camp out here, and uh, we're going to get this thing done together. And I think that's important for searchers to remember is uh, you really have to put your whole life behind it to get it done. Be willing to do untraditional things to get a transaction done. Um, and don't pretend to be anything that you're not. So when I, whenever I met with an owner, including Chuck, I was very quick to explain the search fund model um, in great detail because you want an owner to embrace it. Uh, it's a really quirky thing. It's kind of a crazy model um, when, you, when you sit back and think about it. Uh, and so there, there's some serendipity involved, but, it, but there also has to be a match and, and, a, and an equal understanding of embracing the search fund model for it to work. Yeah, yeah. And as a small company owner, too, I think, you know, after operating for 30 some odd years independently, it's, it's, it's very different to have somebody come in and put a microscope on your business, something that I've never had done before. So uh, it was so far off our radar screen, whether it's gap accounting or, or whatever we talked about, and, you know, um, it's, it's very different. So I think as the owner who is being approached by a search fund person, I think they have to be open to that and be willing to open up their books and do whatever it takes to have somebody really go into it in detail. My, my, my guess, Chuck, is that David um, did spend a lot of time with you helping to get you comfortable on your business being under a microscope. And so, you know, your involvement, your commitment to being here, boots on the ground, working with Chuck through that uh, difficult process that has the opportunity to really, um, you know, we talk about deal fatigue. I mean, it's it, it has the uh, very strong possibility of creating that for a seller that's never had that level of, um, you know, people looking into their business, I'm sure was uh, critical to, to getting that done. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, David, thank you so much for joining us. Chuck, yeah, thank, uh, you. thank you for sharing your insights. Sure. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy days. Um, and thank you uh, to you all for uh, joining, uh, listening, or, or viewing. Um, this has been an edition of the Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition podcast brought to you by the Polsky Center at Chicago Booth.